In our last lecture, we learned that seeing was a construction of the brain. It's the process of higher order visual areas of the brain to create percepts which we subjectively experience as vision. Now our subjective experience of hearing is also a construction of the brain. So in this lecture, what we want to talk about is the auditory system, the system that allows us to be able to hear. We have pressure waves that affect specific receptors. They're going to transmit information to our brains. And ultimately, the cortex again is going to result in our subjective experience that we call hearing. Just as in the visual system, we don't just see edges, we don't just see contrast, we don't just see that. We make sense out of what we see. It's one of the ways we gain information about the external world. And we'll see that in the auditory system, we don't just hear noise. We hear sound that has meaning for us, and that's a construction of our brains. So let's turn our attention to this sensory system. Now, for the auditory system, I won't be going into as much detail as I did in the visual system. What we want to do is to get a general idea as to how information is processed in this sensory system. We'll also want to look at in what ways that vision and audition are similar, at least on a neurobiological level. So let's start with our peripheral auditory apparatus. So we have an external ear that's out here an external ear out here, and we have really pressure waves that come into that external ear. Now, we call them sound waves, but that's about the same thing as calling a cone that responds to short wavelength light a blue cone, okay? This isn't sound, this is just a pressure wave, but we call them sound waves. So they come into this external ear, they're going to cause the vibration of this membrane here, then that information is going to be transmitted to the middle ear. We'll learn about what the middle ear does. And ultimately, that will be transmitted to the inner ear. Now, these structures up here are involved in the vestibular system. And this is a system we aren't going to be talking about in this course. But down here is the structure, the cochlea, that is involved with the auditory system. So here we have sound waves come in. And then we need to have a process whereby those sound waves can be transferred to a fluid medium because all of these structures in the inner ear are filled with fluid. And if we cut across that cochlea, we would see that it's a multi-chambered structure that has fluid in it. Now, sound waves are funneled into the external ear. This is important. This is one of my little dachshunds, Heine Studmuffin, and he has very impressive funnelers. Now, in human beings, we don't have ears like that. What we do is to try to localize sound, we turn our heads. We turn our heads so that the sound or pressure waves will come in a particular way. Now, once those sound waves come into the external ear, they're going to cause the vibration of a tympanic membrane. And the tympanic membrane is known as the eardrum. And it's just a membrane that's pulled tight, which is like, like the surface of a drum, a skin over a drum. So it's called an eardrum, and that's the tympanic membrane. This is going to separate, this tympanic membrane is going to separate the external and the middle ear cavities. So here's our tympanic membrane or eardrum. This is why you don't want to stuff things in your ear because it causes perforations in this tympanic membrane. So you don't want to do that. Don't put anything in your ear. So here's your eardrum. And then what we want to do is we want to transmit that information which is coming in across this middle ear. We do this by basically having the vibration transmitted across the cavity by a chain of three of the tiniest bones that are found in the body. So these are basically just tiny little bones that efficiently are going to focus the acoustic energy that came in through air 
into the dense fluid medium, which is going to be found here in the cochlea. So this process is very important because if it didn't occur, we wouldn't be able to hear faint sounds. So we have to have a way of magnifying this so when this pressure is transferred to fluid that we're able to hear. And this transfer by these tiny little bones results in an amplification of about 30 times. Some estimates are as high as 100 times in particular animals. So the inner ear again, which is where the business takes place, and this is all in the periphery out here, this inner part of the ear is made up of this multi-chambered structure called the cochlea. Then part of the cochlea is this structure right here, which is the organ of cordy. And we'll be coming to that because this is where the auditory receptor cells are actually located. So the cochlea is that fluid-filled structure, which is in the inner ear. And this is, shows a, a real section through the cochlea. This is that multi-chambered, it looks exactly like the drawing. And this is that organ of cordy, which is part of each of these multi-chambered uh, structures. So the organ of cordy is going to be important because it's the part of the cochlea that actually contains the neurons, which are going to be the receptors for the auditory system. And the receptors in the auditory system are called hair cells. Now, there's many different kinds of hair cells, but what we want to do here is not go into the specifics of the auditory system, but to get a general idea. So I'll just use hair cell to mean auditory receptor. So in that organ of cordy, you have receptor cells, just like in the retina, you had rods and cones. You had photoreceptors. And when the sound is funneled through that external air and then magnified to go into fluid cavities in the cochlea, what is going to happen is that vibration in the uh, organ of cordy, there's a particular membrane in the organ of cordy, and it's called the basilar membrane. And the vibration of this basilar membrane causes excitation of the auditory receptor, the hair cells. So they're connected in such a way that you have a membrane and you have hair cells. And when the membrane vibrates, it moves these little hair cells. So it stimulates the receptor. So now we have vibration or movement causing stimulation of a receptor. In the eye, we saw that light was absorbed by particular types of receptors, and that set off the process in the eye. Here we have vibration of membranes, and that vibration of the membrane is going to fire off the hair cells. Now the hair cells, again, are comparable to the photoreceptors. And just like there were chains of neurons in the retina, that were involved in this process, you're going to have pathways involved for the auditory system as well. The movement of this basilar membrane, you see this here, the vibration of this is as a traveling wave that courses down this basilar membrane. There's a little bit of a difference here in that the auditory receptors are in the peripheral part of the nervous system. So these cells are a little bit different than our retinal ganglion cells are that are projected to the brain in the visual system. So now in the auditory system, it's different because remember, in the visual system, the retina was actually an outgrowth of the brain. In the auditory system, we have a peripheral structure. So it's part of the peripheral part of the nervous system. And the neurons are different. So the neurons have a cell body, and they have two processes. And these are going to be out here in the periphery. One of the processes is going to be associated with the hair cells. So when the hair cells are deflected, it will set off a change in the firing of that peripheral process. And the other process of these neurons are the ones that actually go into the central nervous system. So the difference in the organization is really just due to the fact that our ear is a peripheral structure. Now, what we're going to have in the auditory system uh, um, is that
the neurons are going to be spontaneously active, just like what we saw in the visual system. And the projections are going to be organized. But now they're going to be organized along a different plan than what we saw with vision. And this makes sense. If we look at this, what happens is that you have the vibration of this basilar membrane begins at the base of the cochlea and travels along this membrane with an increasing magnitude to a point of maximum stimulation. So that's just what we've drawn here. Is, but imagine it as a traveling wave and some point as being the point of maximum stimulation. When this information is sent to the brain, the brain is going to interpret the point of maximum stimulation as being a particular pitch of sound. So now what we're going to have in the auditory system is a map on the auditory structures of all the pitches along the basilar membrane. So it's like the basilar membrane is mapped onto auditory structures. So a particular pitch, a particular vibration, of this basilar membrane is going to go to a particular point in auditory structures all the way up to the cortex. And that's how the brain hears different pitches. Now, just like we had in vision, where there was this retinotopic map, we have this tonotopic map. Also, it's organized point to point, just like our retinal projection was. High frequency uh, pitches, are at the cochlear base, the low frequency pitches are here at the apex. And so basically the basilar membrane again is going to be mapped onto the structures in the auditory system. And that's how our brain is going to get this various information. Now, just as there was an increased amount of neural tissue in the central nervous system, for vision that was dedicated to the foveal or macular region of the retina because we are animals that are interested in high acuity vision, guess what more neural space in the auditory system is going to be devoted to? Well, it's going to be devoted to the processing of sounds that are found in human speech. So in the human auditory system, the amount of neural tissue in auditory structures throughout the brain and up into the cortex, more of the brain will be devoted to processing that information that is found, the pitches found in human speech, than any other sounds, because those are the sounds that are most important to the system. Remember, the visual and auditory systems are the main way we get information about an external world, and language and the use of speech one of the most important ways that we interact with each other and we get information from the world. Now, another similarity with vision is that in vision where we lost the flexibility of our lens, and you remember that we lost the flexibility of the lens of the eye, and that meant that we were no longer able to see close up because our lens wouldn't round up so that we could focus close up, so we kept holding things farther and farther away. Well, it turns out that there's a similar thing that happens during aging in the auditory system, and it's called presbycusis, and it's comparable to presbyopia in the visual system. And it's specifically a loss of hearing at the higher frequencies. So we have a loss of hearing at higher frequencies as we age, and that's specifically due to the loss of flexibility of this basilar membrane as we age. Now, I want you to remember that fact. We lose hearing in the higher frequencies as we age. And I want you to remember that because when we talk about language, it's going to explain why sometimes older people have trouble understanding words. So we will come back to this when we talk about language. Moreover, in the auditory system, Auditory neurons, these receptors, are extremely sensitive to loud sounds. They can be damaged very, very easily. Now, what does this remind you of? Well, we had mechanisms in the eye. You remember the pupil? The pupil closed down under conditions of bright light to protect the retina. 
Well, we have mechanisms here in the auditory system which are going to do exactly the same thing. What we're going to have is the brain is going to send impulses down to that middle ear zone. Remember those little tiny bones that change the amplification from the external ear information, the pressure waves that come in from the external world, come in through air. We're going to have projections that go back to the ear and actually dampen that transmission or amplification in the middle ear. And this is how the brain has devised a way to protect our auditory receptors. Now, if you want to have an idea of how much dampening really occurs, some of us, when we're going to work in the morning, we have the radio turned up very loud. And depending on the kind of music you like to hear on the way to work, you might be listening to Mick and the Boys. You might be interested in ACDC. It doesn't make any difference what group you're listening to. If a song you really like comes on, up goes the volume. Okay? And you go on into work and you're singing away and everything is fine. Notice that night when you go back and get in your car, you turn on your car and this blast of noise hits you. Because originally while you were driving and you were turning up the volume, your brain was trying to turn it down so you didn't damage your auditory receptors. But when you turn your car on at night, there hasn't been any dampening taking place. And so the full volume that you had turned up in the car comes on. So we have all these little mechanisms for protecting our receptors because, again, these are neurons. And so if the receptors are lost, they aren't replaced. Now, there's some exceptions to this, but in general, they aren't replaced. Now, we spent a lot of time talking about what happens peripherally because this is very important in the auditory system and to understand. But what happens when the information reaches the brain? Because, again, it's the brain that's going to help us form a percept that is going to allow us to experience sound. So you have the pressure waves coming in. And you're going to have uh, this cell that has two processes, one associated with a hair cell, going to be stimulated. And then you're going to have the central process project to the brain. This is where we have to really try to simplify what's going on. The projections to the brain in the auditory system are unbelievably complex. But I would like to communicate to you why they're so complex. And if you think about what the auditory system has to do, it really makes sense. The auditory system, notice that you have a head and two ears. And this is a bony skull. and You have two ears. But sound waves are coming in from 360 degrees, from sides up and down all around. So in order for us to even tell where a sound is coming from, the brain has to do an enormous amount of calculation. And to make meaning of that sound is even more incredible. Now, you might be a simpler animal, and that would make it easier. Say, for example, my dachshunds. The only sounds that really seem to be important to them are the opening of the cookie jar that contains the doggy treats, and also the opening of the refrigerator. These tend to be sounds that are really important to them, so they're really attuned to those. Also, I might mention that the sounds of human voice don't seem to make any difference to them at all. They don't care what I say uh, or anything. What they care about is that refrigerator door and the cookie jar. Now, for human beings, we differentiate between many, many different kinds of sounds. And so the brain has this incredible job to do because there's these pressure waves coming in to our ears at all times. And there's all kinds of background noise to filter out so that we can focus on something. So the auditory system is very, very complex. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just summarize a little bit about what happens when the information gets to the brain. One thing is similar to the visual system. And that is in structures in the brain that you have auditory information. Information from the two ears is going to be kept separate. That makes sense, just like information from our two eyes is kept separate. And we're also going to have high frequency and low frequency sound kept separate. So you see in the auditory system something very similar as you saw with vision, and that is that there's multiple parallel pathways, again, transmitting the information. 
But once you get to the central nervous system, things get very complicated. In the visual system, we saw that something projected in this half of the visual field goes to this side of the brain. And things from this side of the visual field go to that side of the brain. Well, in the auditory system, because of the calculations that the auditory nuclei have to do on the information, we have an enormous amount of bilateral projections. So you have information coming in from one ear on one side, and the, those central processes of those neurons are going to synapse onto a specific auditory nucleus in the medulla. And for the other side, those neurons will synapse in the medulla of the other side. But up to and including that point, if you have damage on one side, you'll be deaf on that side. So everything up to and including that synapse in the medulla, if you damage any of those structures, you will be deaf on one side. Beyond that point, the projections of those neurons are to many different nuclei on both sides of the brain, and there's crossing in all different areas and, and all over, so that the processing gets very, very complicated. The consequence, which is a good one for human patients, is that beyond the level of the medulla, if you have unilateral damage, which means some kind of damage or a brain tumor or something that interferes with some nucleus in this pathway, only on one side of the brain, you won't be deaf. You will have a lessening of your ability to hear normally, but you won't be deaf because your brain is basically getting information from both sides because of all the bilaterality of the projections. Now, in order for us to have a subjective experience of what we call hearing, we need to have our cortex get the information. Remember, the cortex is the seat of the mind. This is where we experience subjectively what we call hearing. Now, do you also remember why the thalamus was called the anteroom? It's called the anteroom because anything that wants to go up to the cortex has to go through the thalamus first. So, just like in the visual system, you saw retinal ganglion cells project to the geniculate, which was in the thalamus. We're going to have a specific structure that is in the thalamus that's going to receive auditory information. So there's a lot of various pathways, a lot of nuclei in between here and there. But ultimately, for us to have the percept of hearing, we need to have these projections to the thalamus and from there to the cortex. So all these bilaterality of projections have this wonderful consequence that you don't see uh, people lose their hearing with unilateral damage. And ultimately, the pathways are going to synapse in a structure called the medial geniculate nucleus. So if we look at this section, this is a section through the brain cut in this plane. And this is right at the mesencephalic diencephalic junction. So let's just think about what I just said for a minute. We know that the mesencephalon is immediately caudal to the diencephalon. So when you're making sections through the brain, you can cut it such that you can see the posterior part of the diencephalon, but also see the midbrain in the same section. So this is midbrain, but these structures out here are part of the diencephalon, and they're the part of the thalamus in which you find the lateral geniculate, which is the lateral knee-shaped structure out here on the lateral edge, and then medial to that, you would see the medial geniculate nucleus, which is the medial knee-shaped structure. And this is the midline of the brain right here, so the medial geniculate is medial to the lateral geniculate. Now, in order for us to have a percept of hearing, what we need to have is a projection from the medial geniculate to primary auditory cortex. Here's Brogman's map again, and primary auditory cortex is actually over the crest in the temporal lobe of the, um, the temporal lobe up over the crest of the sylvian fissure. And so that's where primary 
auditory cortex is localized. Now, let's just look at our map and review a little bit. In the visual system, the retina projected to the lateral geniculate, and the lateral geniculate projected to 17, and then 17 projected forward or rostral. In the auditory system, the ear projects basically to the medulla and then to many other nuclei, ultimately to the medial geniculate nucleus, and the medial geniculate nucleus projects to primary auditory cortex or Brodmann's area 41. And from there, it will project to auditory higher order areas that are found in the temporal lobe. And so the same kind of process that we saw in um, vision, we also see in audition. So how do we know that seeing is a construction of the brain? How do we know that hearing is a construction of the brain? Well, in hearing, the one thing I always uh, remind students is we actually, for the very first time ever, we can actually answer a question posed by old-time philosophers, and that question was, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it make sound? And the answer is no. Sound is a construction of your brain. It's a personal, subjective experience. And so it is your brain that creates it. So no, there would not be any sound. Humans are meaning-making organisms. And what this means is that we don't hear noise, we hear sound that has meaning. Now, it doesn't mean that there can't be noise out there, but our brain is going to interpret that specifically as noise. We are meaning-making organisms, so the whole purpose of having your primary auditory cortex and these higher-order auditory areas is to take different aspects of the information which has been transmitted about pitches, about what's coming into both ears, and to make sense of it. And the most obvious example of this is language. Human beings, we have a disproportionate amount of our auditory structures which are devoted to the processing of pitches and sound that is found in human language. This says how important this is. In another animal, their tonotopic map would be organized differently. But for us, it's language that's important. And if you want to do a little uh, demonstration or think about, uh, try this with yourselves. You want to make sure that hearing really is a construction of the brain. Making meaning of what you're hearing is a construction of the brain. Try listening to me speak and not understand the words I'm saying. If you are a native English speaker, then you can't not interpret the sound as having a meaning. So if I say, the cat jumped over the stream, you can't not hear that as meaningful. You don't hear it as noise. You don't hear it as random sound. What you hear it as are words that have meaning. And that's because the sounds of language, and as we develop a lexicon, as we develop language and words, those specific sounds actually become mapped to meaning in our brains. So if I say the word cat or the word dog, it brings up an image and you cannot hear cat or dog as anything else. Note also that when you hear people speak other languages that you don't understand, say a language you never heard before, we're going to go to New Guinea and we're going to have someone talk to us in their language. Notice that it sounds like noise. And that's because to our brains, the meaning of their words has not been mapped onto our brains. Being able to hear language, be able to make sense of the sound that we hear is a construction of the brain. Thank you.